We have two great speakers here tonight. Richard Hunt from Medical Director and Tom Osborne from Longitude Systems. And yeah, well, Richard will talk about visualizing Australia's health today. I'm very glad to have you here. He has been one of the um, early supporters of this meetup. He hosted us back uh, when he was still working at Vodafone and we had a great time uh, over there. That's two years ago now already. Uh, time flies. He has been working in a variety of industries over uh, a 30 year period, including retail insurance, telecommunications, and um, <coughs> using statistical software mostly. He's currently senior data scientist at Medical Director. Well, and as I said, he will be talking uh, about a talk with a title. That's not on that slide, or is that your title? Um, <laughs> what he told me is uh, that it is about visualizing Australia's health. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks so much for coming here today. Please join me in welcoming Richard. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Fabian. That's, uh, that's a great introduction. Um, look, um, before I get started too much, you possibly many of you have not heard of Medical Director, so I thought it might be a good idea just to start tonight by introducing who we are, what we do. Medical Director is a software company. They make software. They make software for GPs. So if you go to see your doctor and you twist your head around and have a look at the software on his screen while you're doing that, one time out of two, that's likely to be medical director software. We have just under half of the Australian market for GPs and GP software in Australia. So that's what we do. I don't actually work in the software area. There's another side to the, um, uh, to the business, which is an analytic side. And the business has been going for roughly 20 years now, just under 20 years. And for a fair proportion of that, we've actually been collecting data from GPs, which we use to do research. And thus, and people with access to the other screen, my apologies, thus the GPRN is the General Practice Research Network. And this is a, um, a cohort of data that is collected. I'm just looking at this little widget. OK, that worked. I will click the button instead. There we go. Um, yes, uh, we've been collecting uh, data from uh, GPs now for around about, well, established 1999, roughly June, July 1999 uh, is the first data records that are in the uh, system, and that makes it around about 17 years old. Um, we have, um, the data's been collected from GPs if I, uh, and I should also say, we, when we collect the data, uh, we try to do that Australia-wide, okay? So the, roughly in proportion to the population in each state. So that it is vaguely represent, uh, uh, representative of the Australian population. Um, uh, we'll talk, oh, wonderful. I think I've got that now. Um, so in, in terms of how we collect the data, I think it's actually worthwhile um, spending a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, the first thing that happens is the GPs are invited to participate. The GPs are around about 400 in number that we collect this data from. That's out of a total of uh, almost 16,000. So you can see that it's actually only a very small, small fraction of GPs in Australia we collect this data from. The, the, um, once the GP agrees to donate their data, we install some software, which is called the DET, or Data Extraction Tool, uh, onto their, uh, their system in their surgery. Okay. Now this software uh, de-identifies the data, removes all the patient notes, removes the name, removes the date of birth, removes anything that might be personally identifiable, and then um, extracts that um, data and sends it off to our servers. Now, um, there is a big poster, which I've completely forgotten to bring along tonight. I had a, a lovely example of one of the posters that get uh, hung up on the um, notice board in the surgeries. We give to the, the GPs um, advising the patients that actually this surgery is part of the GPRN, 
the General Practice Research Network, and that the um, uh, their, their data will be anonymised, uh, de-identified and sent on. Now if they don't like that, well, they can actually opt out. What they do is they go, they're actually advised this, they can go and talk to the GP and there's a little tick box in the uh, software and the GP ticks that and then that patient's records are not extracted. Okay, so it's very much, um, we spend a lot of time and trouble and as I say, the, uh, the um, process has actually been externally audited as well to make sure that we're in compliance with proper legislation. This is obviously fairly sensitive data. We treat it very seriously. We treat our um, patients' privacy very, very seriously. Okay, so if I move on now, in terms of what information we get, um, it's quite a variety. We get um, some demographics. So we get age and gender and um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander status, those sort of things. We get diagnoses of um, specific diagnoses, although we don't get the notes that the GP writes. If the GP says, right, this patient has got asthma, then that we get a flag saying this, you know, this patient is identified with asthma. Um, we get um, the prescriptions that were written. We get the reason for the prescription, which is just generally a 20 or 40 character. Um, uh, description. Um, we get any results of pathology and imaging. Um, well, the imaging requests and the pathology results. The, um, um, we also get any uh, clinical measurements, so things like the BMI. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And uh, also some risk factors, um, smoking, alcohol consumption, that sort of thing. And, and as the final point there, um, things like the um, uh, length of time the patient spends with the GP, that sort of thing. In terms of the 17 year history, we've got 1,400 GPs who've collected data from 4.1 million patients over 46 million visits to their doctor. This is a vast asset of longitudinal data. I have to tell you personally, this is an amazing set of data to work with. Okay, I find it absolutely um, a really um, interesting and astonishing just to delve in and find the, the little nuggets that are hidden well within the data. I, I just find that amazing. Um, in terms of the services that we offer in our analytics part of the uh, business, um, there's a, a number of them there. What I'm hoping to show you tonight are some, um, uh, some proofs of concept of some things that aren't yet out in the market, but we hope to have them built soon that will, oh, sorry, um, wrong button. Uh, population health. So I'm going to show you some stuff about the population health. I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about some patient journeys, some patient pathways and, and show you some of the things that we can actually do. Now if you'll excuse me one moment, this is slightly awkward and technical operation. This is the proof of concept that I was talking about and I might just grab the um, laser pointer again too so that I can point at things. What you're just looking at at the moment is a bit of a map of the Sydney area and the what I can do if I can <coughs> find my mouse pointer ah there we go um, you can see as I move the mouse pointer around it's a fairly dynamic map and um, I can actually, it's a bit like Google Maps this software, okay, I can move it around and I can zoom in if I want to and zoom out. Okay, so this is uh, very similar. This is actually, um, for those of a technical bent, this is R, this is shiny, this is a package called Leaflet. Okay, so this is some, um, some fairly basic uh, technology we're using. It's really just proof of concept uh, style stuff. Now, um, before I go too much further, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about this, uh, this level of detail here. Um, I, I'm aware, some of you may not be um, too aware of how the ABS and the government collect data these days. Um, many people try to do analysis based on postcodes. Now postcodes are all very well and good, but they were set up by the post office to help postmen deliver mail. People in a postcode tend to have quite different characteristics. 
So there might be some who are quite wealthy who have a very high socioeconomic status and others who are quite, have a quite a low socioeconomic status. And in fact, if you have a look further on the, um, the ABS website, they actually claim that the post office hasn't actually released boundaries for postcodes in 20 years. Boundaries are available from private organisations and according to the ABS, they don't agree with each other. So they are fairly down on the whole concept of postcodes generally. Now, what they have done from the 2011 census onwards, they introduced these, uh, this concept of statistical areas. So although we have postcodes in Australia, uh, and there are about 2,500 postcodes, what the ABS work with as a more basic unit is this thing called an SA2, or a statistical area level two. And it's round about the same size as a postcode. So two and a half thousand postcodes in Australia, there are 2,200 SA2s in Australia. And the SA2s tend to have fairly sensible names that map to the suburb that they cover in the same way that a postcode does. However, there's very little overlap between, you know, there, there is virtually nowhere that I'm aware of where a postcode and an SA2 are the same boundaries or even vaguely similar. So they are quite different concepts. The um, statistical area um, system that the ABS adopted is a hierarchical one. So at the lowest level there are SA1s. SA1 covers around about 400 households. There are 55,000 of these in Australia. SA1s are grouped together to give you an SA2. SA2s are grouped together to give you an SA3. SA3s are grouped together to give you an SA4. You're getting the picture, I think. SA4s are grouped together to give you a state or an SA5. Okay, so that's what we're uh, doing. And in terms of the level of detail, that's what you're looking at here. Now, um, what I might do is just um, switch this. At the moment, you can see what we're looking at is uh, diagnoses of anxiety, um, obviously designed well for a presenter in search of, uh, in front of Data Science Sydney. Um, if I uh, switch, however, we'll have a look at depression. That's what happens after the presentation um, when you mess it up. And I, what I'll do is I'll just switch to SA2. Now, what you can see here, if I move the mouse around, around a bit, I can actually just click on an area and display a profile of that particular SA2 and all the things that we know about the people in that SA2. Now we've obviously collected this data from our general practice research network, our GPRN, but these are not raw figures from any one practice. Okay. Um, a key problem is that people who go to the doctor generally go, uh, go because they're ill and older people tend to be ill more often than younger people. Okay. It's a bit of a biased sample. One way that we work around this is that we do something called age standardisation, which is an algorithm that is published by the ABS and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And so we age standardise all the rates that you're seeing in front of you uh, to um, the uh, 2001 census uh, uh, data. The, um, the other thing to note is that um, we have Round about, um, at the moment, it, it's very between 300 and 700 GPs on the GPRN at any one time. Uh, at the moment, we've got around about 400. Now, 400 GPs, 2,200 SA2s. I think you can see that 400 and 2,200 doesn't go too well. Um, yet, I have data for most of the um, SA2s. Let me just uh, click that little X. Uh, except for the grey areas, which I've specifically greyed out because I'm not happy that I've got enough data to estimate there. But what's happening is that I've, behind the scenes, I have actually built some models based on census data and a number of other data sources that we have available to us. We, we've actually estimated what the rates would be in those areas. Okay. Again, for those of a technical bent, this is the XGBoost algorithm. Okay, so these are not linear models. This is a gradient boosting algorithm. There's some people nodding. I, obviously, I've got some people here who know what I'm talking about. That's great. Um, but yes, I, I realize not everyone's uh, interested in that. So let me now, I'll just drag this up a little bit. 
The first thing I might point out to you is um, Kingswood Warrington. We're looking at rates of depression. Okay. Now, if you're familiar with Sydney, you'll know that out around Penrith, out around Mount Druitt and Kingswood Warrington is actually quite a low socioeconomic area. And for um, those of you who might have some experience with population health metrics, you would probably be well aware that there is generally a very, very strong association with socioeconomic status and with the amount of disease in a given area. So it doesn't actually surprise me to find high rates of depression out, uh, out west. The one that is perhaps requires a little bit more thought is Narrabeen. That is not a low socioeconomic area. If you're familiar with Sydney, that's on the northern beaches. There's a lot of very wealthy people up there. This had us going for a while, and uh, what we eventually discovered was that in Narrabeen, there's actually a um, war veterans home and some hospitals, um, which are outpatient hospitals and, and the like. These people are very likely the um, war veterans are being diagnosed with or, or have PTSD. And so that what is what we think is happening up around uh, the Narrabeen Way. Now, we're looking at rates of depression here. What I might switch now is have a look at prescriptions. And I'll just come down and what we'll do is have a look at antidepressants. Well, the first thing is you can see there is some um, uh, out west. We can see some uh, uh, prescriptions of antidepressants. Um, not so much here. May it's possible. We're, we're incredibly fortunate at Medical Director. We actually have two GPs on staff for me to consult. And um, I, I use them quite a lot, especially with this uh, particular tool. Um, I, I asked the, uh, one of our GPs about this and he said, look, out west where there's a low socioeconomic status, what probably happens is they can't afford the drugs. So they're not getting them from the GP. What they're probably doing is going to hospital outpatient uh, area and getting them there. And that's why we're seeing a lower rate um, just in that specific uh, Kingswood, Warrington area. However, Narrabeen does have that higher rate. And obviously the people in Narrabeen can afford um, the, um, the, the drugs. But it's, um, it is sort of fascinating to look at, if I can just, sorry, this is uh, rather more awkward than I would have liked. <coughs> now that should be Banks Meadow down by the airport. If your memory is a little bit good, your visual memory, you might remember that this did not have a very high rate of depression. Yet they've got a high rate of antidepressant usage. That's fascinating. So this is where my GP's friends come in. It turns out, and I was astonished to find this because I have virtually no background in, in health at all except for my own health, which is we won't go into. Um, the, um, it turns out that GP's do prescribe antidepressants for reasons other than the patient being depressed. Um, a patient being in chronic pain is another reason for prescribing antidepressants. And this was quite a, um, quite a, a uh, revelation to me. So that suggests we look a little bit further. And last week I spent a little bit of time and updated this system so that it now has the 2016 census data on it, which was only released in uh, um, data pack form um, the week before, and I'll just zoom in again, and what you can see here is that Banks Meadow, we're now looking at the median age from the census of people in Banks Meadow, and you can see they're actually, they're quite old. Um, it was actually a very similar situation on the 2011 census, by the way. Um, it seems there are a lot of older Australians in that particular SA too. 
So I'm thinking that older Australians might very well have more chronic pain and thus might explain the use, the, the um, uh, extra use of antidepressants in that particular area. Okay, so th look, this has been very rushed. I'm sort of very aware that I've got limited time to present things to you and I've got one more to do as well. So I, I'm, I'm just going to move on now. I just would like to say in conclusion that I'm, I'm hoping this sort of demonstrates the power that we can put the data that we've got, especially when we combine it with um, external data sources. And here I, all I've done is, is combined it with the census data. But there's an awful lot more that we could, um, we could do and that we're actually planning to do as well. Uh, okay, what I might do now, I'm just going to switch here and unfortunately that has not come out particularly large and is not particularly visible. So the first thing to show you I suppose is that this is another dynamic chart. This is known as D3. Uh, if anyone's familiar with D3, um, and this is a Sankey diagram. Now what I'm looking at here is the patient journey. Patients on their way towards being diagnosed with diabetes, type 2 diabetes mellitus for those into the, um, the, the technical um, terms. The, um, before I go on I'll just explain how the diagram works. The size of the boxes roughly tells you how many patients are in a particular cohort or a particular um, subsegment. The colouring of the boxes deals with how bad the patient outcome is. The darker it gets, the more trouble the patient's in. Okay, so, uh, and as I know you can't read that, uh, or I'm pretty sure that only those with exceptional vision can read that, I'll just point out that um, uh, the second column of boxes is where we start looking at this diagram. So these are people who had a particular pathology test in the first six months of last year. The test is uh, called an HbA1c, also known as glycated haemoglobin. Um, the haemoglobin molecules in the blood get a uh, permanent attachment of some um, uh, uh, glycerin or uh, um, basically some blood sugars uh, attached to the uh, molecule. That, ha that happens for the life of the blood cell. So this is actually a measure that gives you, um, uh, because blood cells generally last 40 days or more, this gives you an average reading of the blood sugar levels of the patient over the pre preceding five, six weeks. Okay, so um, there's some patients there, the top ones you can sort of see uh, had a normal result and um, down below you can see down, you, down the bottom there uh, that's where the result was a high level. And uh, what I did though bef before that, if you have a look at the first column of boxes, I went back in time. For those patients who uh, had that test, and by the way, these I should have said, these are patients who had not previously been diagnosed with diabetes. For those patients, as we work, um, work backwards in time, they had a, um, a free glucose test or glucose tolerance test in the preceding six months. And some of them actually had that test and the result was high. Okay, so as you can see here, those who had a high test and then went down here and had a high result on their first HbA1c, actually they're in a bit of trouble. There's two pieces of evidence suggesting that actually they're not in great shape. Um, after that, um, this box where I've got the laser pointer there is the, uh, says that's where they visit the GP. Let me come over and point it out on the other one as well. Uh, that box there is where they visit the GP. So that's the, uh, the pretest. This is the high result from the HbA1c and that's the visit the GP. So after getting the test, uh, after taking the test, they go back and visit their GP. This makes a lot of sense. Then we get this great thing here, no further events. Now that can be interpreted in a number of ways. Unfortunately, we, when we're trying to evaluate a negative, it's a bit hard. Um, 
our immediate thinking is that this is actually not anything to do with the GP. We think this is a patient compliance issue. Okay. Um, the problem is that very likely what has happened, having been on the end of this, receiving end of this myself, I know, very likely what has happened is that the GP has gone out and said, Oi, diet and exercise. Diet and exercise. Diet and exercise. You get the diet and exercise lecture. Okay, now I actually, personally, I haven't had the high results, but um, we get the diet and exercise lecture anyway. Uh, the, um, from there, possibly what's happening is that this is scaring off the, pat the patients from taking the next blood test. So there's a few there, uh, and I know, again, my apologies, you can't read that. Um, a few patients there who have taken a second HbA1c and the result is high. Again, now at that point they should probably be diagnosed as diabetic and put on to the, um, uh, to the uh, regime. But I think a few patients are not really, um, are really basically too scared to go ahead and do that. And there's a lot of, I think, um, certainly from my generation, there's a lot of misunderstanding in the community that, you know, oh, diabetic, I'm going to have to have injections of insulin. I'm going to be injecting myself with insulin. Actually, for type 2 diabetes, the first round, that's not the case. Um, the first round uh, therapy is something called, a drug called metformin. Okay, metformin, as I understand, is a small blue pill that you take, and uh, this helps control your blood sugar levels. So, um, if you do this, then diabetes does not actually progress. I will take a second now to um, just talk about the, um, the disease generally. Diabetes costs the Australian economy just under $3 billion a year. Okay, now that's a figure that will probably, uh, I think it's estimated here around 2.9 billion around 2030. But it's a, um, it's a huge, huge sum of money that is being spent on diabetes uh, in Australia. Um, the way, di what happens to diabetic people who, if they are not diagnosed, is actually rather frightening. Okay, so one of the things that can happen is something called diabetic retinopathy, where you go blind, basically. The second thing that can happen, if you don't get treated, is that you can start losing all the feeling in your limbs. This is what's happened to my little brother. Okay, he has actually lost. He, he ignored his medication, he ignored his doctors for years, and he has now lost all the feeling in the bottom half of his legs. And the, there's a big problem with that because if you happen to get injured, you don't know. You can't feel anything. My brother can actually stick a needle straight through into his uh, muscle of his leg and not feel a goddamn thing. Um, it's frightening because if they do not find that there is a problem, that they have injured themselves, that wound can become gangrenous. The leading cause of limb amputations in Australia is type 2 diabetes. This stuff is bloody scary. Um, okay. Having said that, and, and spoken a little bit about the, the disease, um, I, I, I think that this sort of illustrates that these patients here, and this is another you know, no further action box here that is obviously a bad outcome for the patient. We really need to try and identify these patients and try and get them back in. Um, look, it's tempting to stand up here and start telling you guys, okay, if you're over 40, if you've got an Asian background, if you've got blah, if you're overweight like me, if you're eating pizza at data science meetups, <laughs> you're in trouble, go see your doctor. But actually, I'm not going to do that because the truth is I'm nowhere near an expert. I'm sort of a mathematician. I'm not really an expert in health or public health or anything like that. All I will say to you is please go and see your doctor and take the advice. And, and particularly if they think that it's worthwhile getting a test, get the test. Go back and get the results. Follow the doctor's advice. It's really scary what can happen. Okay, 
Having said that, that is more than enough time, so I'm just going to uh, switch back, if I can. Ta-da. And just put up the last slide. We're actually interested in running a graduate program later this year. And that's actually the main reason why I am here tonight, not to scare you silly about diabetes. <laughs> um, we are going to be looking for uh, recent PhD grads who have some experience or expertise in vision recognition systems. Okay, That's pr primarily what we're going to be looking at. Um, I'm going to get onto the Meetup website uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. I'm going to put my email address up there. I would invite anyone to just shoot me their name and contact details. No further details required right now. But please, if you're interested, um, we we'll possibly do this as part of UTS. We'll possibly also include, um, you know, I know Eugene and Fabian have got some ideas around um, having a, um, an intern program here as part of DSS. So we may very well work that in. Our exact details aren't certain yet, but if you're interested, we would love to hear from you. So if you, you're interested, if you want to have some sort of an impact on Australia's health now and in the future, I'd encourage you to just let us know uh, that you're interested and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. So I think we have time for about two questions. So um, just the two questions, basically one, do you collect any data on the details of the address of the patient? I'm assuming no. That's correct. So where we've got um, location data, it's actually the location of the general practice, the doctor's location. And if the patient happens to have traveled a distance to get there, we just wear that. And it is the, it's the location of where the doctor is, not where the patient is. We have no idea where the patient's come so from. The secondary question is, do you collect any information about the quality of the doctors, the GPs? Do you have like anything like, this is a five-star doctor, therefore maybe Meadows Bank has a I, I, um, <laughs> No, we don't collect any such data. And I would be very reluctant to try and draw any such conclusions from the data we do have. I, I think that um, uh, the uh, prevalence of different patients in different areas will probably pr preclude any such evaluation. Thank you. Okay. Richard, thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Richard.